So things to know and things to kind of not know for the exam number five, which is um, microorganism you know, bacteria and, and fungi. I do want you to know for bacteria whether they are gram positive or gram negative or neither. Okay, there are some that are kind of neither. Um, transmission routes, whether or not there's vaccine, and disease that the microorganisms cause. On more specific note, I will give you an idea, like, I'm going to tell you, please know this. Please know that. Like, for instance, there are, um, I don't know, have you seen, there's a, in the list of study guides, there is so-called addendum to study guide number five. So at least several toxins, you need to know the mechanisms, main causes of uh, bacterial meningitis, three main causes, main causes uh, for neonatal meningitis, bacterial neonatal meningitis, three main groups of spore-forming microorganisms. So it's kind of at least like, know this, I can ask that stuff. Does that make sense? So we're going to start with the conversation about gram-positive microorganisms. Are we done with exam four stuff? Huh? We're done with exam four stuff. Yes, yes, thank you. So exam four stuff, what we finished before the lab, that was it. So this is the material for exam five. Exam five is entirely bacterial and fungal pathogens. Now, I want to apologize, they're not grouped in any particular logical order, okay? So, first one is Listeria monocytogenes. And this is Listeria So, what's interesting about this is that it's psychotrophic, so it grows in the cold, which means it can, it contributes to the food contamination and food spoilage, it causes gastroenteritis, garden variety gastroenteritis in adults, and can cause neonatal meningitis. So along with Streptococcus agalactiae and E. coli, Listerium anisotogenes is one of three main causes of neonatal meningitis. Is that clear? Now, what is the what is the source? What is the transmission route? Source is zoonotic, so it is found in animal products, but the transmission essentially is via food. So it can be milk, it can be poultry. There were actually reports of listeria transmission uh, via cantaloupes. There was a really kind of funny outbreak associated with cantaloupes. When listeria was on the skin of a cantaloupe and people were cutting it through without washing, contaminating the flesh of a cantaloupe, and then, you know, it's not, it's not, particular, it's not particularly bad for adults. Now then we have Mycobacterium leprae, which is kind of fun to talk about. So first of all, the name tells you that it's technically gram-negative, right? It's Mycobacterium. But it does produce that mycolic acid layer, which protects it from destruction by macrophages. So Mycobacterium leprae is acid fast bacteria, so you have to stain it, not with the typical gram stain, but with the acid fast staining. And it is the causative agent of leprosy. 
there are two forms of leprosy, cranialomatous, which is characterized by formation of granulomas or tuberculomas, basically the, 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 the swellings under the skin, and lepromatous. So lepromatous form is characterized by the death of the connective tissue, and this is what we usually refer to when we say, you know, like, leper, right? People with, like, rotting flesh and stuff like that. That's basically lepromatous leprosy. People don't feel those uh, damages because nerves are also completely destroyed, so they lose sensitivity, okay? Now, transmission. Well, first of all, source. So it is zoonotic disease, and it's interesting, it is... Uh, the, the, the reservoir for leprosy are armadillos, which makes me wonder how people catch it. Unless you hunt them, uh, to catch an armadillo is almost an impossible feat. Um, it can be transmitted by contact or respiratory route between humans. Leprosy is treatable, but treatment requires um, long commitment. Let's put it this way. Okay, it's really, really long commitment. Does that make sense so far? Now, kind of on the same note of acid fast, there is another weakly acid fast bacteria. Nocardia steroides. Okay, so it also has a small layer of mycolic acid outside, so. Acid plus bacterium, right? Uh, basically, it's a soil microorganism. But it is transmitted to humans, mostly in a nosocomial sessions, uh, setting, sorry. and it is opportunistic pathogen. Now here's what I want you to notice. What are the infections that nocardia contributes to the most? Pneumonia, endocarditis. Now take, take a look at last two, last two lines here. So nocardia steroides, is transmitted, check this out, in the nosocomial settings, which are what? Hospitals. And it is opportunistic, which means it infects immunocompromised. So it infects people who are in the hospital already and sick and the immune system is compromised. Does that make sense? On top of that, look at this the next one. So pneumonia is the infection of a sterile space, a lung. Endocarditis is an infection of a sterile space, a heart. So it kind of adds to this. This microorganism cannot compete with your normal microbiome. It kind of illustrates that your sterile sites are more susceptible to infection compared to the ones that have microbiome. Does that make sense to you? And we're going to see this over and over. So um, I'm going to put two more kind of opportunistic pathogens here. One of them is going to be Actinomyces israeli. So this is typical gram-positive microorganism found in the skin and oral microbiome. And it is also a pretty common opportunistic pathogen. So what kind of infections can it lead to? Well, in the mouth, if it overgrows, it can cause gingivitis. It can lead to wound infections. and endocarditis. So now if you look at this, again, it's an opportunistic pathogen. Does that make sense? It's opportunistic. 
if there is a disruption in the oral microbiome, it will result in a super infection and result in gingivitis. An infection of sterile spaces like connective tissue and heart, you know, are the most sort of dangerous. Does that make sense? The next one that I wanted to mention here will be Gardnerella vaginalis. So this one, uh, it's, it's a bit tough to talk about it because we don't really know if it causes the disease, okay? So it, it is implied to play a role in bacterial vaginosis. Okay, we're good? Bacterial vaginosis. Now, what happens? The, the, common, the common hypothesis, the common idea is that somebody has antibiotic treatment, okay, which results in the decreased number of lactobacilli in the vaginal microbiome, which results in increased number of Gardnerella vaginalis which results in vaginosis. The main culprit is this. Listen, we don't really know if elevated numbers of Gardnerella vaginalis cause vaginosis or they are just a concomitant sign of vaginosis. You see what I'm saying? Like something else causes this complex disease and Gardnerella is just elevated, that's all. Make sense? Right? Got it? Good? Okay. Now let's jump back to um, um, Jesus Christ. another big primary pathogen. You look at the name of the microorganism, you can immediately tell what it causes. It causes diphtheria. Okay? So, basically, it's bacterial pharyngitis. Not that it is limited to bacterial pharyngitis. Don't get me wrong, it can be a systemic infection with a really, really bad outcomes. But the uh, interesting thing is that toxin inhibits translation, which results in cell death. Good so far? And cell death results in the formation of pseudomembrane, of dead of white blood cells, bacteria, epithelium. Okay, so what you have here, check this out. You have a patient who has pharyngitis, right? Inflammation of pharynx, large tonsils. But on top of that, literally on top of that, pseudomembrane is formed out of all those dead cells. The pseudomembrane can become so large that it can obstruct the respiratory passages. The person, like, they cannot breathe, essentially. Make sense? This is a very contagious disease with R0, um, if I remember correctly, like 10 to 12. It's rivaled by measles, probably, only. But, good news, it is vaccine preventable. So D in DTAP is for diphtheria. What did you write after dead or bacteria? Oh, sorry, white blood cells. Just white blood cells. 
Does that make sense so far? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, almost done with compositives. Just cool. running out of colors, but who cares? Okay, um, another basically primary pathogen. Two mycoplasma species. So what is so interesting, and look how I've positioned them, <laughs> mycoplasma and mycobacteria. Uh, mycoplasma species are molecules, which means they have no cellular life, which means their cells are pleomorphic. Uh, what's, I think, is remarkable about mycoplasma, all mycoplasma, these are the smallest independently growing bacteria organisms in fact does that make sense which means you can isolate mycoplasma and you can cultivate them in the medium without any other cells just grow them like regular bacteria does that make sense they are stupendously small the genome is about 500,000 base pairs contains about 500 genes something like that Makes sense. So they're really, really small, really primitive. And they can replicate outside of the cell. They prefer intracellular infection. By the way, something that I forgot to mention, mycoplasma prefer intracellular infection, just like mycobacterium. Mycobacterium leprae, I'm going to put it here, it infects macrophages. Okay. You know, the best way to avoid the immune response is to infect the immune cells. So mycoplasma, you have two species that I want you to know. Mycoplasma genitalium. Um, it's sexually transmitted disease, duh. And mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, walking pneumonia. Good. So, a um, few things, just kind of things that are obvious. How is that transmitted? By a respiratory route. No question here. Does that make sense? What about mycoplasma genitalia? Sexually transmitted disease. And this is something that I want to kind of lay out here in the form of like, words so that, that then we can move on. Um, Most of the bacterial STDs that we're going to talk about, mycoplasma, chlamydia, gonorrhea, they all have very similar clinical presentation. Now listen, in males, it's the infection of urethra, right, which can result in both reproductive dysfunction and renal dysfunction. Depends on how high the infectious agent can get up via the, the urinary system. That makes sense? Urethra, urethritis. If it gets into the urinary blade, bladder, cystitis. If it manages to get all the way to kidneys, you know, pyelonephritis. Make sense so far? Good? Awesome. Uh, now, what happens in females? In females, it all starts with the infection of the vaginal mucosa. Then it goes into the uterus, often causing endometri uh, endometriasis. And then from the uterus, if it's left untreated, it can migrate into the fallopian tubes. Infection of fallopian tubes results in salpingitis, which may lead to infertility because of the scar tissue in the fallopian tubes. And if you remember, fallopian tubes open in the pelvic cavity. So if microorganisms spill from the fallopian tubes in the pelvic cavity, it leads to pelvic inflammatory disease. It's uh, pretty hard to treat, and, but it's long-term untreated bacterial infection of the reproductive system. Does that make sense? Clear? Good. In that's kind of a big difference in males, since reproductive and urinary system have the same orifice, 
infection can spread in both. In females, STDs usually are confined to a reproductive system. We good? Good? Okay, moving on. Now we're going to talk uh, about, just checking, yes, we're going to talk about a couple of, uh, no, not a couple, a few of um, sort of common members of the human microbiome, gram-positive members of the human microbiome. And the first one here will be Enterococcus species, for instance, Enterococcus fecalis or Enterococcus specium, uh, fecium, sorry, uh, found in the gut microbiome. Since it's found in the gut microbiome, it is exposed to various antibiotics that we take orally. So one of the distinctive features of Enterococcus, they pretty antibiotic resistant. It is a typical opportunistic nosocomial, nosocomial pathogen. So this is something that I want you to all appreciate. I want you all to appreciate. Look, do we have like we hear people in this room? Do we have enterococci in our guts? We absolutely do. Can they be antibiotic resistant? They absolutely can. Does it pose any risk to us? Not really, no, because they're members of the microbiome. The problem starts when they escape, remember um, the portal of entry story, and they start entering not the spots that they're supposed to. So mostly it results in the urinary tract infections, wound infections, and pretty notorious endocarditis. Okay, we're good. Now we're going to move to a couple of members of the gut microbiome. Not uh, gut, sorry, skin microbiome. One of them is Propionibacterium acnes. Okay. Um, leaves and hair follicles. And here's the story. This microorganism feeds on the sebum, the oily substance produced by sebaceous glands. We good so far? Right? So it eats fat. Um, when we enter puberty, hormonal changes increase the production of sebum from our sebaceous glands which results in disproportional growth of Propionibacterium acnes and inflammation of the hair follicles, okay? And that results in a condition known as acne. Um, I'm going to ruin some food for you. So, uh, propionic, so basically what this bacterium does is called Propionic Acid Fermentation. Not for the exam, just, but Propionic acid fermentation is a key component of the maturation of Swiss cheese. I'm not saying that this microorganism will make Swiss cheese, but it is known that if, as I'm quoting a microbiologist, if you pop a zit and spread it between your fingers and smell it, it does smell like Swiss cheese. This is why, by the way, many cheeses, like really well-aged cheeses, they smell like old, dirty socks. Because the same biochemical process is involved in cheese maturation and in, in the, the metabolism of, of sebum by propionibacteria. And finally, um, I don't know why I chose it, but anyway, Micrococcus. Luteus. Micrococcus means small coccus, and luteus means yellow, which reflects the color of the colonies that this microorganism produces. 
uh, it's the component of the skin microbiome. Nothing too particular about Micrococcus. Um, can it be an opportunistic pathogen? Yes. Mostly causing endocarditis. But I looked up the cases of mycococcal endocarditis. We are talking about extremely immunocompromised patients. What does it do? Hmm? What does it do? Oh, endocarditis? No, the mycococcus. So normally it's on the skin. But if it ends up in the circulation, it may result in the infection of endothelial cells on the cardiac valves. That makes sense? There are infection and inflammation results in the formation of what's called, uh, I believe it's called vegetation. Like, so basically, the valve becomes kind of mangled and it doesn't close completely. It results in regurgitation and if it's not treated, eventually cardiac failure. All cases that I found, and we're talking about like single digits, are in people who, whose immune system is basically gone. So it's not, it's not, it's a rare, very, very rare case. It just shows you that uh, when we say, oh, this is not a pathogenic microorganism, probably it was not in the right environment. Does that make sense? Now, next three, well, yeah, they are non-pathogenic, let's be honest. So I like this, guys. These are gram-positive probiotic, and, and we're gonna we're gonna spend a little bit of time in the conversation on what is probiotic. So um, lactobacilli, uh, bifidobacteria and stock. So these folks, all of them, are gram-positive probiotics. Uh, the term probiotic is very loosely defined, and in this particular case, we're talking about microorganisms that can positively modulate your microbiome. Does that make sense when consumed? So for instance, lactobacilli are the most common species present in the vaginal microbiome. Bifidobacter are very common in the gut microbiome. Are you following me? So these are known if you, if you consume them, if you eat lactobacilli or eat bifidobacteria, uh, it will have a positive impact on the balance of your gut microbiome. It's been shown to relieve the symptoms of things like inflammatory bowel disease and bacterial dis uh, and vaginal dysbiosis and even impact some respiratory infections. Does that make sense? Uh, the main problem always is that it's those studies are really hard to perform because uh, the composition of whatever you consume is tough to control. But all studies point to the fact that if you eat food that is rich with those, so we're talking about very lactic fermentation foods from sauerkraut to kimchi to um, various dairy products. You know, huh? Yogurt, yogurt, buttermilk, all very good probiotics. That makes sense? Now, I want to highlight one thing. When we're going to move on to gram negatives, there will be no good guys. Like none. Does that mean there are no good gram negatives? The problem is, eh, we don't really know. So, for instance, there's a, there are a couple of genera of gram negatives called bacteroides and parabacteroides. They found in the human gut. That's not for the exam. Found in the human gut. So my 
collaborator and I, well, I participated in writing a review, okay? Does that make sense? So, when I was collecting the, the literature for the review, you read a couple of papers and it says, oh yeah, it's, you know, absolutely awful and it will lead to inflammatory bowel disease and colitis. You read another paper from another study and say, oh yeah, th this same microorganism has probiotic properties. It alleviates inflammatory bowel disease. And valid study, so it's very, very kind of controversial. With these ones, there's no controversy there. Eat yogurt, drink buttermilk, okay? So this is why like we only reserved to gram-positive probiotics. Questions? What is the lymphocytic It's, huh? Because the, the video was the gut and then larger was vaginal was... Yeah, leuconostoc is mostly in the food. It's not so much in the microbiome, but it's in the food and it positively modulates microbiome. Good?